and Wendy are in Orlando. Uh, that's where he's having the surgery. So pray for Mark and, and uh, that surgery tomorrow. But Mark usually does a welcome. I said, Kelly, you're going to do it. He said, well, what are you preaching on? I said, well, why did Jesus come? That's not what I'm preaching on. I'm preaching on where did he come from? But I, we're going to get to the idea of why he came. But the, but the title is where he came from. And the text is taken from John, the ninth chapter, verse 29, where the Pharisees said to the man that had been healed that was born blind. Do you remember that story? The Pharisees said, we know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he's from. And I look at the world today, and, and I look at how they view Jesus, and I recognize they don't, they don't know where he came from. That They picture Jesus as just another man, they picture him as a good man, probably, and, and some have even said that, that he was a good man. He treated people well. He had compassion on people. He fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He was a good man, but they don't recognize him as the Son of God, and they don't recognize where he came from, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. And so I, I began to wonder, I, how many Christians do not fully understand where Jesus came from? I've told this story before in classes, and maybe from the pulpit as well, but I remember I was probably seven or eight years old. I was at my uncle's house, and somehow I overheard a conversation that he was having uh, with his wife or with somebody else and, and talking about Jesus and, and where he came from. And, and I, was, I was flabbergasted. I mean, even at seven years old, I had been in the church since I was three days old, I guess, or two weeks old, I don't know. And I didn't fully understand where Jesus came from. So let's look at this for just a minute this morning. Number one, the, the, point, the main point is this. He's eternal, and he came to earth from heaven. You see, at seven years old, I had not fully realized that Jesus didn't just enter the world as a baby like every other baby. I mean, I, I, I certainly have no knowledge of any existence prior to uh, being here and, and have no reason to believe that I had any existence prior to being here. So my beginning was the day that I was born into the world. And we read this story about Jesus, and, and now at this time of year, we're going to hear a lot about the birth of Jesus, and we're going to be talking about it over the next two or three weeks. And, and you just think, if you don't understand that Jesus is eternal, that he made his showing on earth in Bethlehem, and that was the first we know of Jesus. But the Bible tells us a completely different story. The Bible tells us that just like God the Father is eternal, Jesus the Son is eternal as well. And I want you to think about that for a minute. That, that means he had no beginning. And that kind of blows our minds. It does certainly with God the Father, and now it does with God the Son and, and the Holy Spirit as well. There's no beginning because everything about us says there's a beginning and there's an end. You came into the world, you were born. We, we know the day that we were born. We don't remember the experience, thankfully, but our mothers do, I promise you. We know the day we were born. We know when we began life on earth, but Jesus had no beginning. Because he came down from heaven. Look with me, if you will, in Genesis 1, verses 1 through 3. Um, well, I'm just, we're just going to look at verse 1 first. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I want to focus in on that in the beginning because John in his gospel begins that same way using those same words. Look at what John says in his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. So think about this. Right there in creation, when we read, uh, when we read Genesis 1 and verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus was there. John says He was in the beginning with God. Nothing was made without Jesus being present. Nothing was made without him being a part of that creative process. Jesus has always been in existence. And so where did he come from? Well, obviously, he came from heaven. Look at uh, John, 6 and, and John 3 and verse 13. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That's Jesus. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Look at John 6 and verse 33. 
For the bread of God is he, that's Jesus, who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And so just imagine for a moment, here is, here is Jesus. He's eternal in nature, just like God the Father. And he was there in the day that, that the world was created. When, when God said, let us make man in our own image, who do you think he was talking to? He was talking to God the Son. He was talking to, to God the Holy Spirit. They're all right there in this creative process. Let us make man in our own image in the beginning. And Jesus is there in heaven. And for some reason that we're going to talk about in just a minute, we'll get to the why he came. He was willing to leave heaven and come down and live on earth. What's strange about that to me is we're living our lives on earth just trying to get to heaven. He was already there. He had everything that anybody could want. He was in heaven with the Father where all things were perfect. There was no sin there. There was no sin there. It had been cast out of heaven. And then he, he took on the form of man, and he came in the likeness of man, we read, in the flesh. He was clothed in the flesh just like we are. Why did he do that? We'll talk about it in a minute. But he came from heaven where we're trying to go. One other passage, John 6 and verse 51, Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And so he acknowledges the fact that he was eternal. And by the way, the Pharisees never did appreciate that. They tried to kill him on numerous occasions because he said he was the son of God. He came from God. He came from heaven. Jesus said, if anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. The bread that I give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And so the answer to the easy question, where did he come from? Well, he's eternal, and he came down from heaven. But number two, he did come into the world like we did. Now, the circumstances were different. He was not conceived by the relationship of Joseph and Mary. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, but he came into the world through a lineage of people. I don't know about you, but I've mentioned this several times lately, I'm not a big fan of like Ancestors.com. I know that some of you are. I find it fascinating in your life. I mean, when somebody comes to me and says, you know, my great, 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 great grandfather was so-and-so, I find that extremely fascinating. What I have found out about my family, just going back a couple of generations, says I don't want to know anymore, okay? I, I don't need to know anymore. I've got, I've got all manner of people except righteous people in my, in my heritage, and so I don't really want to know where I came from in terms of the people. But Jesus is the same way. As a matter of fact, Jesus, like all of us, came in the flesh from a long line of sinners. And this is one of the things that I love about the Bible. God doesn't sugarcoat anything, and he doesn't try and hide anything. When we read the lineage of Jesus, we find some characters in there. It's pretty amazing that God put them in In the lineage, the genealogy of Jesus, first of all, there's a a man named Perez, and we know that Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. What some of you may not know, if you're not Bible students, is that Judah begat a son named Perez. But what's interesting about that is, he had that child with his daughter-in-law. Now, it's a sordid tale, and you can go back and read it. But just imagine that that Jesus came into the world and part of his genealogy is this relationship between Judah and his daughter-in-law, Tamar, and through that relationship came this child, Perez. Next we find, later on, that Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Well, Rahab was a former harlot in Jericho. And so she was in Jericho She was a harlot. The Bible says that plainly. She helped the spies with the agreement that when they destroyed Jericho, that she and her family would be saved. They became a part of of the family or the congregation of Israel. And, And in that, she met Boaz or Salmon, and they had a child named Boaz, and he is in the lineage of Jesus. Why didn't God do it some other way? Why didn't God bring Jesus into the world through this long line of righteous people? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute, but you know what? None of us came into the world through a long line of righteous people. 
I, I, I know you've gone back in your Ancestry.com and you know some things about your family, but I promise you they were all sinners. We all came from this long line of sinners. And then there is probably one of the most famous stories of sin in Scripture, and that is David and Bathsheba. And through the lineage of David and Bathsheba, they had a son named Solomon that we know. Through the lineage of David, Bathsheba, and Solomon, Jesus came into the world. Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah whom David had killed or to try and cover up the affair that they had. Now, I guess he covered it up pretty well with the people around him, but he didn't fool God, did he? But why did God bring Jesus into the world that way? Why, why didn't he bring him in through this long line of righteous people? Well, the reality is that even several of the kings of Judah that we read about in Israel they all had this notation, and they're in the genealogy of Jesus. They walked in the sins of their father. And the reason God could not bring Jesus into the world through a lineage of righteous people is what we read in Romans 3 and verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Show me in Scripture a, a line of people that could have brought the Messiah into the world, and they were righteous people. They're not there. They're not there because it is the nature of man ever since Adam and Eve ate of that fruit and sin came into the world, every man, woman, they're sinners. And so if Jesus was going to come in through some lineage, it was going to be through a long line of sinners just like us. Romans 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so like all of us, he came in the flesh from a long line of sinners. Now, you may look at your parents and say, well, they may be sinners, but they're good people. And, I, and I'm, I imagine that is correct. I feel that way about my parents. They're good people, but I promise you they're sinners. And I look at Mary and Joseph, and, and obviously we know that Joseph wasn't physically his father, but he did raise him as his child. He is called his father on earth. Um, Mary was obviously a, a righteous woman, but she herself was a sinner. When Jesus died, he died for her, just like he died for me and you. When Jesus died, he died for all the sinners of the world, and that included all of this long line of people that he came from. There was nothing special there. But why did he come? This is where Kelly wanted me to go. Why did he come? And this probably is the most important part. And so as we get into the Christmas season and we see, we see the, the babe Jesus in the manger, and everybody is celebrating the birth of Christ, if you will. Let's remember where he came from. Let's remember who he came from. But let's also remember that he came for the purpose. And the purpose we find in Matthew 18 and verse 11. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. When he says, save that which was lost, he was talking about you. He was talking about me. Jesus Christ came into the world to save you and to save me. He left heaven, the place that we're striving to get to, the place that we want to be, the, the, the place that we consider to be, and rightly so, the, the, the greatest pinnacle of, of greatness and, and, and righteousness, and there is where God resides, and there's where Jesus is now, and, and, and there's where all of the righteous dead are, and that's where we want to be. Jesus came from there, and he came for the specific purpose of saving lost people, and that includes every one of us. It's an amazing story of redemption. It's an amazing story of love that God has for his people that he was willing to send his son into the world to die for us. Luke 19 and verse 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to seek us. He came to save us. He came to gather us together with he and his Father through the Holy Spirit. What a, what a great story that that is. And then we read in John the 10th chapter, in the 10th verse, Jesus is talking about the sheepfold and the shepherds and the thieves. He said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. 
but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You see, when you came into the world, God may have had a purpose for you, but you didn't know what it was. And, and may, you may still be struggling with that today. Many people do. They struggle with, with their purpose. Why am I here? Why did God bring me here? But Jesus came with a very specific purpose, and that purpose was to save lost people And that includes everybody in this room today. It includes everybody in this community. It includes everybody in the world that has ever lived except for Jesus himself. The billions of people that have ever been alive on earth, Jesus came so that they might be saved. He came to seek and to save the lost. It's why he came. So he was in heaven. He came down among us. He came from this long line of sinners. And he came to save sinners, but he's not here today, is he? I mean, as believers, we recognize that he came out of that grave on the third day. We recognize that, yes, he died on that cross so that we might have salvation. He shed his blood so that through that blood we could be saved, our sins could be forgiven and cleansed. But where is he now? Where did he go? In John, the 14th chapter, Jesus told them exactly where he was going. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. I go to my Father, Jesus says. John 14 and verse 28, later in that same chapter, you've heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And so Jesus says, I'm going back to the Father. Where's the Father? Well, he's in heaven. And so now we've got this round trip. Jesus is, he's there where we want to be. He comes into the world through sinners. He came to seek and to save the lost. And now he's gone back there. We read this also in Acts, the first chapter. It it begins in verse 9. This is probably the most detailed story of the ascension. When he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? That's what I would have done. You, right? Jesus is there, he begins to rise up, and, and he's going up through the clouds, and he's going into heaven. I can't imagine that I would take my eyes off of him. And now these angels say, why are you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taking up, taken up from you into heaven, that's where he went, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So where is he now? Where did he go? Well, he's in heaven. I love to listen to what people think he's doing today. You know, there's all kinds of stories out there. The Holy Spirit, we have a great debate. Is, is the role of the Holy Spirit done? I mean, is he, is he dead? There are those that believe that, that once the Bible came into existence, that once we had this canon, that, uh, that his role was pretty much over because the Holy Spirit uh, guided the writers of Scripture and, and, and gave them this inspiration from God to write, and now now that we have Scripture, he's pretty much done. And I don't think the Bible teaches that at all. I think he's got a great ministry and a great work today, working in our lives and, and dwelling within us. So what is Jesus doing? Well, some say, well, he's just he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and that would be true. But what's he doing there? Well, he's, he's mediating for us. That's true as well. The Bible tells us that, that there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, Um, The Bible tells us that when we pray, we pray through Jesus and and through the Spirit, and and they take that and they put it in a way that that God will accept it. But look at John 14 and verses 1 through 3. I find this the most comforting. I find this to be the greatest story of what Jesus is doing for us today. Jesus said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. 
several years ago um, when my dad was alive and we decided that we needed to move him into a home. And uh, that was a difficult day, not a day that I ever want to relive. Um, but before the, a few days before we moved him in, Marley and I went into this room and we prepared it for him. We put pictures on the wall of people that he, that he should remember if he remembered anybody at all. We put a picture of the church that he, that he last preached at that someone had painted for him. And we put all these things on the wall. We put pictures on the desk. And we prepared that room for him. Now, my dad had dementia. He didn't fully understand what was going on. But I had gone to him that day, and I said, Dad, let me take you to lunch. And he said, okay, I'll go to lunch with you. And, um, and, and we, we went to lunch at the manor, <laughs> and then we walked over to his room, and, and, and when we walked in the room, even though he had dementia, he saw the pictures, and he recognized that was going to be his place, and he said, I'm not staying here. <laughs> but he did. And we had prepared that room for him. Within a few weeks... He got settled in, and that became his home, and he recognized that. But I say that because when I think about Jesus preparing a place for us, it's, it's not construction. It's not necessarily a hammer and nails and lumber building us a room. It's building a place where we're going to feel at home. It's preparing a place for us where we're going to be comfortable it's a pre preparing a place for us where we're going to want to be. He didn't really want to be there, but Jesus is preparing a place for us where we want to be. It's personal to us. A few years ago, I got a call from a hospice nurse. And um, she said, Mr. Cornwell, I have a patient that visited your church back in the 1990s for several weeks or months. And now she's dying, and she wants to see you. And so I went down to the, to the nursing home, and uh, she had cancer, and her days were short. She was dying. And, and I got to tell you, it's, it is one of the highlights of my life to meet this lady. She was such a special lady, but her mother had told her that she could not go to heaven. Because she had done something early in life that, that her mother said was unforgivable. God would never forgive her. And here's this lady that had lived her entire life. She was, she was baptized as a child. She was raised in the church. But her mother had convinced her in her 30s that she could never go to heaven. And so we sat and talked about that. And I assured her that that was not true. I didn't know why her mother told her that. Her mother maybe just didn't understand the grace and the mercy of God. Maybe she didn't understand the blood of Jesus and how strong it is. But I told her, I said, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Yes. And you've been baptized for remission of your sins? Yes. Have you prayed that God would forgive you for this sin you committed? And she said, all my life. And I said, honey, you're going to be in heaven. You're going to be in heaven. And as a matter of fact, I told her this. I said, as a matter of fact, here's what I want you to do. When you get there, tell them that you want a room right next to mine because I would be honored to spend eternity with you. Two or three days later, she died. I got a letter from her daughter, and she just said, I just want you to know that after you talked to my mom, her whole disposition changed she was no longer afraid of dying. She embraced it. And she was so happy those last two or three days because she knew she was going to heaven. Let me tell you something. Jesus was in heaven, but he came for us. He came through a long line of sinners. I just think that's proof to us that we're all sinners in need of a Savior. God didn't sugarcoat anything. He came to seek and to save the lost, and he went back to heaven and he's preparing a place for you. But whether you accept that place or not is up to you. Whether you choose to live eternity there or not is up to you. But I promise you, he's preparing a place for you. Is that where you want to go?
Is that where you want to be? Then obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Become part of his family. Allow the blood of Jesus Christ to do its work and to cleanse your sins. If you've not been baptized for the remission of sins, let's do that today. We can do that today because Jesus has prepared a room for you. It's there. If you are a child of God, but you've let sin get in your life and you've turned your back on God, then God is always saying, come back home. Come back home. I just want you to be at home. I don't care where you've been. I'm only interested in where you're going. Come back home and be a part of my family. That's what God calls out to us today. I want you to be in heaven. I want you to be in a room close to mine. I've already got somebody on one side. I don't know who's going to be on the other. I want you to be around me. I want you to be with me. But I promise you I'm going to be there. And I can say that with full assurance, not because I'm a righteous person, but because Jesus Christ died for me, and I accept that. I believe in that, and I give my life to that. And if you want to do that today, if we can help you in any way, We invite you to come while we stand and sing this song. Good morning. We are thankful to see each and every one of you here with us this morning and glad to be able to join join in worship with you. We do have a couple of families this morning that we would like to introduce that have decided to make this their church home. First of all, we want to introduce Jeff and Norma Leiby. I don't think I've seen them this morning, but if you're here, could you stand up? 
There they are, right, right here in the back. So we're glad to have them here with us. And also we have Steve and Amy Griffin that have decided to make this their church home. They're sitting right back here, if you wouldn't mind standing here just for a moment. Glad to have both of these families here with us and look forward to working and worshiping here with them uh, together. What's the next one? Okay, I, I didn't know if that was up there or not. But we, um, Kelly, wherever he's at, Kelly had to, said to fill out the, your attendance cards. If you have not done so, please send that to the end of the aisle and we'll have those picked up. And we are thankful that you are here with us. We have one other announcement. Our Christmas card boxes uh, are out in the foyer. And if you plan to participate in that program, those cards are due today. So please, if you haven't done so, bring those uh, this evening and place those in the boxes. And if you would like to help sort those, please come to the building on Monday. We're going to start sorting those at 4.30 p.m. We meet again this evening at 5 p.m. We hope that each and every one of you can join us for that. At this time, let's stand together as we have our closing song and prayer. I stand to praise you, but I fall. Let us bow our heads. Our most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we're truly thankful for this first day of the week that you have blessed us with and for the time we've had to come and study a portion of your word. Dear Lord, please help us to realize that you've given us the greatest of all gifts, and that is your Son who died on the cross for our sins, that we have an opportunity of life in heaven with you. As Wayne's message was this morning, please help us to realize, dear Lord, that you are interested in our future and for us to focus on that and not our past. Please forgive for our many sins, dear Lord, in Christ and we pray. Amen.